case you have to take off for any reason, you can see it at a later date. Folks, it's my pleasure to uh, present our presenter today, Karen Adams, all right, who teaches at Allen High School. I always want to call her Karen Allen. I'm the famous <laughs> actress from Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm sure she's been confused before that way. Or uh, So Karen has a BFA in graphic design from Texas Tech. I went to Texas Tech as well. Go Red Raiders. She's worked in the graphic design industry for 20 years before she started teaching, and she's been teaching at Allen ISD for 19 years. Um, her subjects started with or included um, communication graphics and technology systems, and her class has evolved into animation over the years and lucky for her she's been teaching strictly animation for 12 years her courses include animation one two and practicum in animation so it's my pleasure to introduce to you karen adams Take hi away. everyone thank you for coming I, i'm glad that there's a lot of interest um, in this i have to say it's the first time i've uh presented so i feel like i've got the info just being you know online is kind of another thing presenting um, i'll be anxious to hear some of your questions um, let, i have a a powerpoint that i'm going to share with you and then i have several links off of that and in order to see the links i have to stop sharing and then share again so that you can see the browser all right look go to this and share and go up to the top <laughs> and let's go all right so once upon a time is appropriate appropriate for this particular presentation because um, as far as animation goes uh, I believe and I think the film people will will uh testify to this as well story is one of the most important things uh to get right before you do any kind of production and even in the industry nobody wants to pay any money for anything until you give them a good idea um, what you're going to produce and how you're going to do it so this is a quote from john lassiter the way a film looks will never entertain an audience alone it has to be in the service of a good story with great characters so you can have an amazing animation but if you don't have story then there's not a, any amount of animation that's going to make that story better so what i'd like to do is do a study using one of our animations that we entered into UIL last year. And uh, this one, I believe, uh, got second place for digital animation. Um, so this one was called Crutch. So what I would like to do is, I know I've only got an hour with you, but I'd like to take up three minutes of it and just watch uh, the entirety of this animation. So let me stop sharing and then go back out to the page that has all of this stuff okay so i'll do this full screen uh let's see uh, paula you can see this animation correct um i don't see the animation i just said that I, mean, I the the picture yes i can see the image okay it hasn't started yet okay well there we go now it's starting <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Did you guys get all that on the credits? <laughs> all right, so stop sharing that and go back to sharing the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so what happens with us is we begin by trying to make a long story short. Uh, the first time that the kids start coming up with ideas, they're often way too complicated. And uh, the reason why that they do this is they, it's kind of based on the hero's journey. They've learned it in English class. They've got lots of character, multiple themes, multiple conflicts. And so they think that that's what they're creating, but you can't do that in three minutes. Um, you have to learn how to pare that down. And even when we, they finally come up with a story, we still end up doing some type of pare down um, so that we can get it within the three minute time limit. Um, and so most of them dive into it as if it's a feature length film, which is, you know, they're, uh, they're impressed by what they see, you know, Netflix, Hulu, and the you know, feature length, everything. So, uh, they try to make it like that. So here's, if you get anything from this presentation, this is the one slide that really encapsulates everything that I try to drive home to these kids is that the short should have one theme, one conflict that intensifies, one or two characters, and one or two locations. So if you can follow that and then start throwing out characters, because some of them have these super complicated uh, characters and, and themes and fantasies, and it's crazy, uh, and they have a, this incredibly long backstory. Um, the inciting moment, I also uh, help them to understand that the inciting moment occurs within typically the fit first 10 to 15 seconds. And so that's when something unexpectedly changes from their ordinary day. So in this sense, you know, they have that, or what does an ordinary day look like? Oh, this changes it. And so then that 10 to 15 seconds into it, we're now going on this big journey, or not big journey, but three minute journey, how's that? And then of course, the same with film, show, don't tell. And here's the three basic elements of story that uh, we talk about in class a character, of course, whom the story's about, goal, what the character wants, conflict, what stands in the way. Why am I telling you this? Because a lot of you people who are watching this really probably already understand this, but we kind of have to go over this and over this uh, with the students, even though they get it in English class um, and you know other methods. I use it for these exercises. The exercises that I use at the beginning of the year uh, 
uh, one is called a personal hell exercise um, and it creates obstacles and raises the stakes and I have a link to that let me see if I can show that to you real quick that's at, at the very end of this presentation I have some oh, there we go uh, I have a, a link to a lot of these things that I'm showing you and let me get to the folder that has this which I may or may not be able to get to quickly I'll do my best I'll do my best uh, let's see uh, Uh, that's not where it is. Um, let's see, where would I put that? Oh, yes. Hmm. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Down here. It's UIL. It's for you guys. Because I made a folder specifically for that. UIL, Capital Conference Resources. Okay. So, uh, here's the personal health exercise and it kind of explains why we do this and this personal hell creates those obstacles and gets them used to it and then we talk about particular examples like a rich man wants nothing more than to acquire money his personal hell is that he finds himself penniless oh my god this person who wants money he finds you know you put him in an opposite situation basically uh, and then this, here's another example. A girl wants to run away from home. She gets a wish and wants nothing more than to get home. So she, even though she wanted that, is that really what she wanted? Because she, in the end, she really wants to get home. And so here's the um, exercise that you, you could go through as different groups, or you could go through, uh, you know, as a whole class however that might want to work out for you um, and so you just put them in the opposite situation that would really drive them nuts and then how can they get out of that that's how you would describe that that gets some of the uh, juices flowing and then there's another exercise the story spine exercise that i like to do with them and we kind of repeat this throughout the lot of their presentations that they do for uh, periodically through this whole process of writing their story. Um, when I first started teaching animation, um, we would kind of hurry through the story process because I could tell that they're really antsy about, that a lot of the students were real antsy about getting started, getting their hands on the computers and you know starting to create something. Well, that ended up making the process a lot longer. The longer I can kind of hold them and get that story solidified, the easier their production process is going to be. Um, and so we have several presentations as checkpoints in their story to find the holes, because even though you hear a story once and you go, oh, these, these parts of the story don't work, then you hear the story again, and then you find maybe some other holes and the more we can see it and get it out to other people you know maybe their peers uh, then they can give the student uh, ideas to make their story better all right so the student the story spine ex exercise goes like this the student uh, the students write a character a goal and a conflict on three separate pieces of paper and drop those into three separate containers then um, each group, you can you can either choose the groups or if they're starting to form teams uh, in which they're going to do their animations, uh, you can let them work in those groups because the more they learn to work together, the better. This is not your typical group work from, you know, English class where, or another class where you have a group project and one person does most of the work. Everyone in these groups has to pull their weight um, so it's really a quite different experience 
students work in groups and put the character in a story using the spine, the story spine as mentioned in the Pixar 22 rules of storytelling. And I have a link here. I'm not going to follow it right now because there's 22 rules. And if you read all the rules at once, that your brain just kind of explodes because it's, it's really good stuff, but it's a lot. And the more you work with this, the more you go, oh, that's why they did this rule. And that's why they did this rule. So you can check those out. But one of them is this story spine. And this, that's where I got this title for this presentation. Once upon a time, there was. And then every day until one day, because of that, because of that, because of that, until finally. And you could end it there. Or you can also add and say, ever since then. Dot, dot, dot. You, and basically, if you go through this with the students and they fill it out with that character, the goal, and uh, the, other, the other thing that I had them do, uh, then they have a complete story. So let me kind of take a step back and just talk about how I'm able to do this in my classroom, because I know not everybody has the opportunity to be able to do this as a class project, but that's how we do it. And I only usually do this with my Animation 2 and Practicum because they're together in a class. And it is a class project. Practicum students, which are my third year students, are usually directors. And they have a big job. They don't know it in the beginning, but they have a very big job. And I have them do a review when it's over about what they learned because th this is kind of almost a real life experience and they're going to have pressures that they didn't realize they were going to have good pressures good learning pressures um, everyone who has a seedling of an idea for an animation may pitch their idea so it could be animation two or practicum kids that could pitch their idea and at this point, they're only doing like a little mini pitch. And I'm going to show you one in just a second. Um, students uh, give feedback after they pitch this idea. And then, the, then the, as a class, we discuss the pros and cons of each of the different ideas. For instance, last year we had 10 ideas, but we had to narrow it down to five or six ideas. And then um, I also tell them that the minimum team size is three students. And even then, those three students are going to be working very hard. And sometimes what we do, too, because I teach, uh, you know, teamwork, uh, if an animation gets finished and another team needs some people to do some line work or what, you know, just the production end of things, they'll, the team that's finished will loan out their artists to help uh, the other team finish on time. So, you know, they're just learning things right and left in this, in this particular uh, scenario of how we do things. Teams are formed by students with my supervision. You know, there's always that year where one student doesn't have a place to go. But because I teach, fortunately, I teach animation one, two, and three, I know a lot of these personalities. And so I could make a good guess where that student might fit and um, I'll put them where I feel like that they can belong. Uh, they're advised to choose one of the ideas that they have narrowed down, that we as a class have narrowed down to, uh, and that they feel strong about that idea. Don't go into an animation if you don't feel strong about it. Um, you know, it's probably one of the only opportunities they get to do that when you're working in the industry you're working on a particular production and that's it. Um, let's see, they also need to know that they're gonna be working closely uh, with that group for five months. So they better feel like they can get along with them. And then we have uh, weekly director meetings. So uh, then I, I uh, spread the information to the directors and then they spread that information to their teams. Um, and that's kind of a very real world situation because, you know, I have principal meetings with my group, my team, and then that, that information is, you know, spread to, um, you know, my students or other teachers. 
And so those are real world experiences as well. So here's a production schedule and I believe that I have this uh, as one of the resources. If I don't, um, I will put it there. Uh, but this only really refers to us. Um, so you would, it's a Word document, so you could modify it however you want. But basically what I'm talking about today is only what's in green. And you can see that that's going to take us all the way to October. And while you think, oh my God, that's so crazy. Yes, it's crazy. Um, but if they don't do this, this ends up being, we, we rewrite the story while they're producing it. So all this purple is production time and then post-production here. And our final cut is actually, you know, around January, at least when uh, UIL is due. And we seem to have to push it to the very end um in january and uh we need every bit of time we can possibly get and i don't know if you see right here but we also have a poster component and i'll talk about that a little bit later all right um i'll refer back to this um towards the end so you can kind of see i'm going to kind of go through each of these steps right here all right so this is the seedling of the idea pitch that Crutch had, and I cut off the part where they had color coded this and the team that they had formed at this time, uh, you know, each color code was a person was going to talk about that. So here's that story spine that I was talking about, and they take their seedling of an idea and they put it in this format. And it's, a, it's an easy way uh, to actually find out if you're your story is going to make sense or not. Um, and by looking at this, and I, I think I, I uh, included this as well in the resources, uh, they pretty much stuck to their original story. There's a few things that they definitely had to change uh, to make it shorter, mostly. Um, and because of that, because of that seedling of an idea presentation, so this presentation that I showed you here, this would be where we had 10 different people coming up with an idea. And we'd talk about it and give some uh, pros and cons. Um, and then after we had all 10 presentations, uh, we would determine which five or six stories were the strongest. And it would be a whole class agreement because the more that the students feel that they own this, the better production or the better uh, end result they're going to have because ownership gives them uh you know a right to their story and they feel that they're in charge you know i'm supervising but and i'm guiding them but i'm not i'm not telling them necessarily which way to go um, students form teams at this point um are you behind the idea of this animation can you work with this group of five p of people for five months without biting their head off of course but let me tell you we have had lots of fallouts over the years you know people going behind people's backs and and you know drama uh but we i use that as a teachable moment and you're not always going to like the people that you work with in the real world or at beyond school and so they have to learn some conflict management by um, doing this and i even have to be the neutral person sometimes uh, but you will have those and then at this point work begins on various components of the next presentation which would be these components the script character design and background, so they can actually start to get their hands a little dirty with sketching out what they think would work for this. Then um, I didn't always have them do a script because a lot of our um, animations are without dialogue. So I thought, well, how can we really do a script like that? And I said, I told myself that we didn't have time, but I had so many students last year say that if they hadn't written that script they wouldn't have been able to work out certain things and it has them think about 
uh, staging. It has them think about shots. It has them think about lighting and all the things that they used to figure out along the way of the production route. And then of course, a log line, very important. So this is what the um, script looked like for Crutch. And uh, you can, I have a copy of this in um, the resources as well. But we, I had them use cell text and cell text used to be obviously free, but uh, you have to kind of scroll down when you, when you create the account because it's going to want you to pay for it. You still don't have to pay for it. Um, you can scroll down and say, no, thanks. I want to, you know, keep using the free version. So just a word of warning. It is free. You just have to kind of scroll down. Many of our animations are made without dialogue. Good examples to show uh, the class might be Wally, which is the first 30 minutes there's no dialogue whatsoever. And here's, uh, this doesn't show the very beginning, but this link will show you, um, I really like this one. Uh, let me go ahead and follow this one and show you. I won't show you the entire, hang on, whoa. Uh, all right, I have to stop sharing for a second and go to it. Uh, here it is, okay. All right, so what I like about this is even though that there's some sounds and what seem, and there is just a tiny bit of dialogue so, towards the end of it, they run the script right below it as we're watching the action. So. So you can see all the descriptions of what's happening. Eve stops spinning, leans her head against his. So these are the things that the kids don't really think about without going through this uh, script process. And so I highly encourage uh, you to have them do that. Um, if you don't want to use cell text, there's tons of uh, word um, templates out there for creating. I have them do the correct formatting that you would do a, a normal script. And at first it's uh, a little wonky for them because my students, you know, film kids are used to it because they produce uh, many more films in the time that it takes animators to produce one film. Um, so my kids, um, it, it feels a little awkward at first, but then they get the hang of it. So it doesn't take long. Uh, then they work on character and background development. And these, the images that I'm going to show you here are just some images that they came up with uh, for the next uh, presentation character for Evie. They also work on color palette. For they, they even, these characters become a part of them because they work with them for five months. So they give them names. And so this guy's name was Rug. The original name for Crutch was Gollum, but they renamed it. And that's one thing I allow them to change for sure, is the title starts out as one thing, but as their story evolves, they realize they need a better name for it. Um, and here's the blade, and then here's the color palette for the blade. Because they have a team of five people, they have to have this information to share with the other uh, animators so that they know exactly what color palette to use. And then there, these are some initial ideas for um, the environments or backgrounds uh, that, they, that they were going to use. All of these would be part of their next presentation. So uh, writing uh, effective log lines is very, very important. If you go on to IMDB, and you look at you know the film and then right below their film there's there's actually that's a log line and so uh i have a link here to the script if you go on youtube you can find tons of information this one's super simple um and it just puts it into plain words how to create it because you think it's not hard it's one sentence but the thing is, is you want to summarize your whole story, but not give it away, but also create interest. 
so uh, this particular link right here will show you how to do that. All right, and I have this link. I'm not going to go to this one. Uh, I have a link to this one in the resources. All right, so this is their team polish pitch. They've got a team now. They've got a log line. They've got some background ideas, and they have a script. So um, by presenting it, um, they're going to. This is a, this is what's in their pitch right here, which is what they've worked on, and then. We spend with 10, uh, let's see, we had five ideas. So even with five ideas, sometimes we had to take two class periods, two hour, 90 minute uh, hour uh, class periods to really go over these because I wanted to give each idea the right amount of time, but I also did have to give them a time limit because my kids will talk on forever. Um, but, you know, what did you like? What did you feel? Uh, needed improvement? What doesn't make sense? And were you left with any questions at the end? Um, so the, the team takes that feedback. They usually have, when we get the feedback, they have one person that's assigned to writing it down all these, these uh, feedback IDs. And then they go back to their team and they have a team meeting. And um, that's what I loved about this is these guys really took the initiative is when they had to have a team meeting, they called a team meeting, you know, and it was up to them. If something was kind of going off course, they had a team meeting, but they also knew that that team meeting took up time from them producing it. So they were very aware of their time um, management. So I couldn't think of anything better with high school kids and time management to make it better for them. Okay, so here is the polished pitch <clears throat> that uh, Gollum was the original name. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink here. Um, Gollum was the original name and Crutch was the final name. This is their log line. And I ha also have this in the resources, but hang on, uh, let me stop sharing and bring you to this. Okay, so then they put their artwork in and then they put it in the format, once again, of the story spine. So they put it together and they kind of have some more quick sketches of what they think that might look like. You know, this is always gonna change. A little bit but it's still in that rough form that nothing is set in stone so then we go through the whole story because of that because of that until finally and then ever since then rugs given evie the independence she needs learning to take a step back and then they usually had some art which i just showed you previously and then um, sometimes they had a slide at the end that says questions uh, because we would have a, a feedback session at that point. Uh, let me go back to presentation. All right, so that's the polished pitch. And here they would get quite a bit of uh, really detailed uh, feedback. And because of that, this closes any holes that are in the story. Teams, the roles are defined by now, like, you know, are you doing line work? Are you doing rough animation? Or are you doing uh, the credits? Or what part are you playing on this team? And that's, the whole idea is to divide and conquer. Because at this point, they're gonna head into production, but before that, there's still the storyboard and animatic. Um, and these are all kind of considered checkpoints. The storyboard is a checkpoint. And the animatic, do they have the story right? You know, are they going to uh, stage it right with that storyboard? Um, and so there's still some more presentations, but these are considered minor compared to that polished presentation. Um, the roles are defined. Also, I wanted to say that the director plays a big role in rounding up and being, and also for the 
well-being of their group because a lot of them can lose focus or realize that this process is just so incredibly long. And, you know, I've had uh, directors even have like a little, you know, sleepover at their house. It was an all-girl team. Um, but they would just kind of do some team building sort of things. And, or they would meet to go see a movie or, you know, they would do some stuff so that it would build that, you know, let's still work together. Let's l understand each other. So here's the storyboard. And while, you know, storyboard comes in many, many, many formats, they decided this past year that a lot of them were going to do it on post-it notes because the size that post-it notes were was the perfect size for them. So they would put them on these pieces of paper and then they would scan them for the presentation. And this, and I have this, uh, there's a link to this and this link goes to that folder where I have all the resources for you. Uh, so after the storyboard, we also have a presentation for that. We, we try to breeze through those fairly quickly and uh, just to kind of make sure that they've got the right idea for the right moment, you know, the right uh, shot. And this is where definitely where film and animation uh, intertwine a little bit. We have what's called an animatic. There were many years where I didn't do an animatic because I thought we didn't have time. But if you don't have your kids do an animatic, one of the things that can happen is that they're working out the timing of everything at the same time they're producing it. I, that's not what you want to be doing. And so now I couldn't live without them doing the animatic because they work out how long uh, to do something. How long do we see that expression? How long do we focus on what just happened? And that, that, information. So this is actually uh, a very, very super rough version of their film. So I'm going to click on this and just let you see the beginning of this. Hang on. Uh, let me stop sharing so that I can get you over to this. Uh, okay, here it is. All right, so I believe on this one, they had multiple artists do uh, each scene, like the director assigned certain scenes to certain people on their team. And then they had to uh, composite all of it to put it together to see if the timing worked correctly. They were also going to put um, sound effects in there. And then if they had anything close to their original, their, uh, their background music that they wanted to use, then they should put that in too. I'm not going to show you the whole thing on this, but so you can watch it later. But I just like to see, like you to see how rough this is so they could work out timing. Okay, so uh, you can see how pretty rough sometimes the background appears, sometimes it doesn't, uh, but that's not what's important. What's important is the timing. And so we look past all of that. And uh, let me stop sharing that. And I will share the presentation again. I kind of have to say that out loud, otherwise I just can't get through it. Anyway, all right. So then after the an animatic is done, we have another little discussion and we say, well, we think more time should be here, uh, less time on this scene. Um, and so they go in and make those changes. And then 
this is actually occurring before the real animation occurs. And even though we have a nice finished background, so the background people have been working on backgrounds at this point. And so we may have a nice complete background, but the front is still just in sketchy format. And a lot of it could resemble uh, the animatic and sometimes the work that you do for the animatic the more time you spend on doing that animatic, probably the less time you might have to do on the rough animation. So let me take you to this so you can kind of see the difference, how this one might look. All right, let me follow this link. And I will stop sharing so I can go to this. All right. So you can see our backgrounds appear, sometimes they don't. Um, but this is mostly to get the rough animation. And then if they do have the backgrounds completed, they want to throw those in because they want to make sure that the characters are working with those backgrounds at that point. All right, meanwhile, back at the presentation. All right. Okay, so in addition to all of that, I have them do uh, these components. One is the poster and last year was the first year that they started doing thumbnails. Uh, this would be something that would be your first image that you might see when you, when someone does a search and finds your video. This would be the thumbnail that you could use instead of just a screenshot of one of your one of your scenes. Now if you let Vimeo or YouTube choose your thumbnail, it's usually crazy. So you can control that. And so we just have them, I'll have them do that this year as well, uh, is create a, um, a thumbnail. And then this is the poster, size is 40 by 27. And it's really funny when these posters are done and they stand back and I put them up in the hallway for anybody who passes in our hallway to see. Of course, this year is going to be different. Um, yeah they'll still do the poster. Um, and I'll probably find a way to get it out to as many people as I can in a virtual way. But uh, they feel like their animation is real and they're very proud and it's just amazing. When they see the poster, it's the first tangible thing that they have of their animation, of their baby, you know. Uh, and it's just exciting for them. And I love seeing that. All right, I'm coming back to the production schedule because I pretty much have left off right here. The backgrounds, even though I have them here, you could, once you get approval, you can start, you can move this background stuff over to here. Uh, because the sooner you get this stuff done, uh, it'll leave you more time for cleanup and digital coloring because that really takes a long time. Uh, I used to have the poster done a little bit sooner, but what was happening is they were spending so much time on trying to design that, they weren't getting a lot of this done. So I really kind of put it more to the end. It could be moved a little bit closer, but it takes away from everything that they're doing for the animation. Um, they'll get it done. And especially the more they work on the story, they have a better idea what to put in that poster. And uh, I've had a lot of compliments from a lot of the teachers and say that my kids do a really awesome job. And we have even uh, helped out, Renee Harris is on um, this workshop today. And we've even, ha I've, she's even, uh, worked with me about getting some of my students to do backgrounds 
uh, projected backgrounds for her productions. And also uh, what I had some of her students do was her students did some voiceover work for my first year students for an animation that they were doing. I have them do a little animation so they kind of get used to the idea of doing it in animation too. Um, and that was an awesome experience because you go to the professionals when you want something done, right? We're not professionals about doing voiceover. They are, they use their voice all the time. So, you know, there's a lot to be said. So any of you who are theater people today, think about contacting the person who does your animation or film and try to do some uh, crossover work with them. Um, a bit about organization. I chose uh, to use Crutch as a case study because they had awesome, awesome organization. And this is their, this is an actual screenshot of their um, folders in Google Drive. And you can see uh, how they put it all together. And I know you're dying to see what Daddy Dwayne is. Uh, but uh, they even had a student, his name is Ethan, and he did some poses for the guy in the market who was, you know, waving the, uh, the blade all over the place. They gave him a name, his name was Blade Lad, and it was so hilarious. And I'd love to show you some of these pictures, but I don't know if we really have time. Um, <clears throat> but you can use students you know, to pose to get the right shots. Because we don't know, as an artist, every artist uses reference and, or any artist who is really good will use reference. And so we might do that. And so they, they're really organized. Um, and then they make funny ones like Sidra's house gulag. It's up to them. We, ha we can do it, we can put it all in, um, our network drives, but they found that a little difficult once they were off campus and they were, you know, working from home uh, to get to some of those files. And that, so they felt like using a Google Drive was just as well as better, just as good. I am not speaking well. Um, shared to team and teacher, so it's also shared with me. Uh, team decides on an agreeable, agreeable naming convention, and I encourage them highly to stick with it. There was this one group last year, and they just named it whatever, and I just kept saying, you guys, you're never going to find your files, and guess what? They couldn't find their files, and, you know, that's what happens. Um, organize folders, upload files daily to work at home, and so they were really, really good at that, this uh, crutch team. Um, team contacts, the director should handle this, but make sure each person on the team can connect with each other. And I let them choose how to do this. Some of them created a Discord, some of them had a group me specifically with that. I always had them um, put me in as um, a member of it so that I was kind of aware of what they're doing um, at the time. I usually wouldn't chime in on those, but it just kind of kept me uh, in the know, in the loop. All right, so here's the resources. Here's the personal hell exercise, how to make a log line video, 12, Pixar 22 rules, crutch polish pitch, storyboard, animatic, rough animation. And if you'd like to contact me, here is my email. This book, if you get this book and you read it, you'll notice that I've used a lot of ideas from this book. She is a, the Karen Sullivan is a uh, university professor. And I wanna say she's either from uh, Ringling or SCAD. But anyway, uh, she teaches at one of the major colleges the, uh, for animation. Excellent, excellent book. And um, also there's a companion site where she has some case studies also, and I would show my students some of those case studies as well. So I highly recommend that book. All right.
now I will stop sharing and stop talking to myself and take questions. Oh, and that's perfect, 150. Okay. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Elizabeth Sykes. I work at UIL with Paula, and I know that she got a question that I didn't, but then I also got a question. So, um, Karen, can you talk about uh, maybe some of the differences between the traditional animation category for UIL versus the digital? Um, yes. Um, that was kind of a quandary of ours this year. Um, I don't have that information necessarily in front of me, but um, the rule, I went back to read the rules and traditional, typically we thought was hand drawn with no, um, with no inter not interference, but no um, use of computer, um, Excuse me, I'm going to mute somebody. There we go. Um, and no use of um, computer anything to to finish it. And uh, but then we realized over time there were a lot of people who were submitting animations that they had to composite, and they used After Effects and um, that sort of thing. And so that kind of changed our idea of at least what UIL's definition of traditional is. And I can tell you, we entered in traditional this year because we fit into the uh, definition because it was all hand-drawn. Everything was hand-drawn. Even though we used Wacom tablets, it was still hand-drawn. So, and I know that there's probably some controversy over that. Um, and maybe there'll be uh, some different uh, definition for tradition um, because, and I always thought that traditional animation was created for, because I'm a judge as well. And I never thought it was fair to judge a stop motion against a, uh, computer generated or computer animation. Um, because it's, it's just, it's, it's like judging a, an, a live action film with an animation. It, you just can't do it. Um, and so I, I thought that that's one of the reasons that would really, you know, divide that because we have a lot of districts that I know, uh, the, it's not a class project and the kids do it on their own and it's a stop motion. And that's the, and that's the best that they can do with what they've got. So that's my two cents. Well, great. Thank you. Um, we've had a few more questions come in. One, a specific one. So I don't know if you know the answer to this one about what animation programs might work best with Chromebook. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of stumped on that one too because it won't be Adobe Animate, which is what we used. Um, you know what? I I forgot to put it on the resources, but there are some freeware. Uh, it would have to be loaded on the Chromebook and I most of the districts don't allow the kids to load anything on the Chromebooks, but there's some free animation programs and I will be sure to put 2D animation programs that uh, I will put on the resources page. Um, so hopefully that will help. Yeah. I understand we're all kind of in that situation. I don't even know what I'm gonna do. Uh, we also have a question about um, how you recommend, I guess both with the class and with the individual groups, like working with sort of tracking copyright, like what's copyright free, what's royalty free, like how you help the kids, you know, not score their film to the latest Beyonce single or something. Right, right. Um, well, uh, there's a couple of sites that have uh, copyright free 
music that everybody uses. One was in Computech, and then you can hear the, the music repeated on different animations, like, I use that. Well, that was used for, you know. So there's another one called Purple Planet, uh, which, is, you, which is free. And a lot of our, I know our film kids use that one, and some of our kids used it this year. Um, we try to look for free, and I tell the kids, royalty free is not free. So they think, oh, royalty free, it's not, it's not free. You still have to pay, it, especially if it's put out on the web. Um, and I try to um, have the, I check in with their team, each team quite often. And I, and I look at what they're doing. So it's kind of a multi-step process and, um, you know, I'll, I'll mix it right, right off the bat. No, they get so disappointed because they're sold on it. And it's like, no, you can't do that. You know, and what better to learn that now than when you, when you get out in the industry, for instance, when I was graphic design, graduated in, in school, you can use anything, right? Right. You can get away with a lot of stuff. But then when I worked in the industry, it's like, I need an illustration for this. Oh, I'm going to have to pay someone. I can't just, you know, I can't just go grab this one over here and use it um, for my mock-up. I have to actually pay someone to use it. So we, it's better to learn that now. And I, I make them stick to that. Great. And then I have a question. So I have a film background and part of my terror of animation is I'm terrible at drawing. So do you ever have students who really don't have those hand drawing skills that find a place in your class or in these projects? Yes, yes. Um, a, lot, a lot of times they might be really good at the story part of it all, as well as um, the lining, the production of it. So a lot of times if you have a group and you have some really strong drawers, those are going to be your people who will do uh, your uh, rough animation. Those will be the people that do your storyboard. And, you know, the only way you get better at drawing is to just keep doing it. And, um, and we even use stick figures if we had to. Um, so even though somebody says I'm weak at drawing, there may be an opportunity where they have to do some drawing. Um, but usually you're strong, you'll put your stronger people on the rough animation and the um, storyboard. Great. And then tied into that, um, someone has a question about how do you choose which animations from your class to enter into the UIL contest? How do you narrow that down? Uh -huh. There's no, there's no formula for that. However, um, these, these kids at this level, second and third year, they're pretty smart and they know a good story when they hear it. Um, even though the seedling of an idea isn't complete, they might see it as, you know, it's, there's the 12 principles of animation. One of them is uh, appeal and they can recognize appeal in a story or not, you know, is that, is it about the humdrum everyday life or is it, you know, really interesting? Like we had one this year and it was, a, it was called Down in the Dumps and it was about two dumpsters, you know, and one saved the other. And it's like, that has more appeal. I mean, and that story, they cut out so much. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, how they narrowed that down. There were people, there were other characters, but they narrowed it down finally to these two dumpsters that were talking to each other. Um, so I kind of leave it up to the kids' feedback with my guidance, and we determine which are the best five. It, there's no formula. Great, um, and then I guess the last question, which you may have answered a little bit in part specifically to the Chromebooks, but this is broader in terms of, um, are there any 
programs that you recommend to schools that really don't have much in the way of resources at all? Right. Um, I mean, they could enter the hand drawn. I mean, that's very difficult. Uh, but like I said, there'll be there's about five programs that are free and that are 2D. And even if they have one computer and they have to share that one computer to to five students, they could they could still all work on that. And then those programs might I'm not sure might be able to be work on the Chromebooks. They're they they're kind of low as far as how much memory and uh, display uh, processing power that they take up, a lot less than any of the Adobe programs. Um, so that might be the option. And if they're getting Chromebooks and they can get it on the Chromebooks, then you instead of having five kids on one computer, you might have five kids on five Chromebooks, and that might work out. All right, well, I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you so much for the presentation today. That was a great overview, really focusing on that one project and how you kind of manage the class and get everyone on board with everything. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll be Thanks, back. Sir. Yeah, Thanks we'll be back next up. <laughs> more sessions. I don't know if Paula wants to jump in. Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you, Karen. And this was you know, very you know, eye-opening. And I really appreciate that you, your focus was on the storytelling which makes sense, especially we don't know what's going to happen in the next few months. So I think your, your students have a project right now is just to, you know, to create the story first. So, um, And this is something that I believe can be done via Zoom as well mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, with any uh, like process, word processing software. Right. You know, right. any of the links that I have in there too. Celtex, they, that's, they can get to that on their Chromebooks too. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, her presentation will be available in a few days. We'll put it on the site. And, uh, and she, I think, included her email address. So if they have questions, Karen, they may send them to you. So, you know. All right. Bye. So thank you. You guys have a great weekend. And we'll see you next week with a few more sessions. All right. Thanks for all thank your you Thank you. Thank you.